As far back as I can remember, I've been fascinated with the ocean. Uh, before there was Discovery Channel, before there was Shark Week, before there was Sharknado, I, uh, I would watch every Jacques Cousteau special I could find. What I did is, as soon as I could, I got certified as a scuba diver, and I would go in the water as often as humanly possible. In fact, I even went to college originally to be a marine biologist. Uh, I got bored one day when I memorized every Latin name for every snail, so instead I switched to philosophy and then somehow ended up in cybersecurity. Ostensibly, I'm going to talk about swimming with sharks, but more so about the Internet of Things. So given my fascination with sharks, when a fellow security researcher named David Litchfield invited me to go on a shark dive this year, I jumped at the chance. In fact, we tried to get our local friends to come with us. Um, it's surprising how many excuses you can find when you're trying to get people to go on a shark dive with you. Uh, now, my boss was a little more direct. He, uh, he basically stated in incredibly clearly uh, what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator. Perhaps you agree. Uh, you know, fair enough, but I figured it's, everything's a risk-reward, and given how beautiful they are and when I've seen them in the distance on different dives in the past, the risk was worth the reward. Now, as we got in the boat and we got out to sea, I started to get a little nervous. Um, I started reflecting on his words, and it's really shocking just how quickly sharks will arrive when blood is in the water. Within five minutes of dropping the chum, uh, this little guy came around. It was a blue shark, um, much bigger than I expected. It's not the most attractive shark type that I know of. Um, and I gotta say, though, it was gorgeous. It moved with little effort, very deliberately, very aggressively, and the blue will never be done justice in any photograph. It was almost electric. I, I, it's indescribable how beautiful that color was, and you can only see it up close. Now, if you're one of those people who thinks, yes, in fact, Josh was an idiot to go in the water with sharks, um, just remember that Dave is the one who took the photograph. <laughs> now, in security, we have this notion of you don't have to swim faster than the shark, just faster than your buddy. <laughs> well, unfortunately, as we're finding out in cybersecurity, uh, sometimes the sharks also have buddies. So this is one of his better photos. Now, one became two, two became three. After four or five, I have to admit, I got a little overwhelmed. I started to panic a little bit. Even though we had the cage to protect us, your arms, your legs were getting knocked around, and uh, they get pretty aggressive, and they were trying to take bites out of us. And all of a sudden, as much as I hate to admit it, I heard my boss's words once again. What kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator? But here's what happened. At some point, the risk-reward tipped, and it was no longer fun. So I had to get out of the water. You know, your, your primal instinct to defend yourself kicks in. Now, if you think that I am an idiot, this is Dave's prior dive trip. That's a photo he actually took. I don't think I'd do that dive. But we all make our risk decisions. Now, as the adrenaline wore off and we talked on the boat, our conversation shifted on the two-hour drive home, back, or boat home, back to the harbor, about just how hard our, our job in cybersecurity has gotten. Now, we hate the word cyber. We make fun of people who use the word cyber. In fact, we, we may have a drinking game. If you say cyber, you have to have a drink. So I'm already in deficit. But what we were talking about is essentially things have changed so much and we are failing so pervasively that we just don't know if we can trust our best practices anymore. You know, we basically realize our best practices aren't. And what was once good enough is no longer good enough. Dave isn't really a shark photographer. He's a breaker. That's a term of art we use for people who deliberately break software such that they can make it stronger to protect us from bad people. You see, he's one of the good guys. Now, I'm not a hacker. I'm more of a marine biologist of hackers, right? I study them, I classify them, I look at who they are, why they do what they do, what's their motivational structure. I look at their types of prey that they go after in that species and their tactics and methods. Then I use this information to create new strategies to adapt to these new predators. But the bottom line is, despite all of our research, we're losing. Now, just like my boss thought I was an idiot to get in the water with sharks, many of my fellow researchers thought I was an idiot to study these guys. Now, if you're not familiar with the iconography, this is the Guy Fox mask. It's essentially the patron saint of the hacker collective known as Anonymous. In fact, uh, on the 5th of November, just the other day, uh, it's their, their holiday, so to speak. Remember, remember the 5th of November. And while they're not necessarily good, bad, or indifferent, there's a mix of uh, chaotic good, chaotic neutral, and chaotic evil in the mix. Um, they were very aggressive 
and they were new, and I had to study them. Now, what happened is they were different than previous adversaries in the fact that they weren't motivated by economics or greed. This was ideology. So some mix of grievance and fun fueled a rampage where they just bowled down anyone in their path. And I was called an idiot for studying them, but I knew it was important, it was significant, it was of consequence, and it was changing the game. So a colleague of mine, Brian Martin, and I spent a year and a half researching them and wrote the definitive analysis and engagement of the group called Building a Better Anonymous. Now, of the many insights we have, two matter today. Number one is while they lacked talent in the sophistication of their attacks, they demonstrated just how poor a job we're doing at basic security. Uh, I often refer to the summer of lulls, the 50-day rampage, as holding a mirror to our neglect. So they showed just how badly we're doing it. It was a real wake-up call for the security profession. And the second and possibly more important thing is they showed that this new form of power, this hacking power, was available to anyone. And it opened Pandora's box. Now, in parallel, a much more sophisticated adversary happened. In parallel, over the last two years, this could only be referred to as a hemorrhage of intellectual property from the US to the emerging markets like China. Uh, the kitten killers, we like to call them, because every time someone says APT, God kills a kitten. Um, we also hate that term. But essentially, these are state-sponsored espionage actors. And they essentially went on a smashing grab of every single Fortune 500 you can think of. Nearly all of them lost some form of trade secret or intellectual property in the last two years. Now, the combination of the ideological actors of Anonymous and the state-sponsored espionage really shattered our false sense of security that we're doing a good job. Now, I have to punctuate, this is really in the areas where we knew about security, we knew about adversaries, and we were trying to do something about it. And we were putting our best and brightest to defend these enterprises and these organizations against these adversaries. And sadly, we're failing. Now, as we pulled back into the harbor, I have to admit, I was very, very happy to get back to the safety of dry land. Uh, if Dave wasn't there to uh, make me embarrassed, I probably would have gotten on my knees and kissed the ground. Um, but my very, very first instinct was to call my, to call my two daughters. Um, I promised them that as soon as I can get back to my car, get back to my phone, I would call them and promise them Daddy was not eaten by a shark. But as I walked to my brand new car, my 2013 model, my high-tech enabled automobile, it dawned on me that, you know, I might be on dry land, but we're swimming in a sea of technology. The Internet of Things is essentially a tidal wave. Every aspect of your life is now connected. Software permeates everything you do. When you go home today, when you get in your car, I want you to pay attention to how many times you see an operating system, a boot up, some technology, some sort of connectivity. Now, I want you to think about this. I often, often do a word game. If it has software, substitute the word hackable. And if it has connection, substitute the word exposed. So as I walked to my brand new 2013 hackable exposed all-wheel drive car, I started to realize some parallel. You see, when we're trying to defend enterprises, we're failing. We're not even trying to defend the Internet of Things. No one's even thinking about the fact that in this digital sea and the Internet of Things, we also have apex predators. So as I get in the car and I hit the ignition button and I watch the operating system boot up, and I watch the Bluetooth symbol connect my phone, and I see my CD player grab the album information over the internet, it dawns on me for the second time what kind of an idiot gets in the water with an apex predator. Think about that. So after calling my daughters, I made another call to Dr. Charlie Miller, because I knew in one week's time he was going to reveal that he had hacked two automobiles at the largest hacker conference in the world known as DEF CON. My call was very simple. Hi, Charlie. Uh, which two cars did you hack? And is my brand new car going to kill me? He laughed. He said, they're pretty much all going to kill you. Um, <laughs> now, some people call this stunt hacking, but essentially, um, and I'm not going to tell you which two cars yet, um, what they did is they, they found out uh, what the vulnerabilities were. So he dug into it, and essentially he found, he and Chris Valasek, a fellow researcher, it was stunning to me because I'm a techie guy, and even I was unfamiliar with just how dependent the car's functionality is on software. So they did optical things like they could lie about how fast you were going. Who cares? They could tug the seatbelt by simulating a car accident even though you hadn't had one. But the things that should really bother you is they could deploy airbags without a crash, almost certain to cause one. 
Now that many of these cars had parking assist or collision avoidance, they have full control over the steering column. So they demonstrated on video on Forbes.com, you can watch all of these things, that they could actually turn the steering wheel without your intervention. Think about that. I'm uncomfortable with that. You should be <laughs> uncomfortable with that. Okay? And for their final act, they disabled the brakes. Now, if you can do these things with software, I think very logically, if we are dependent on things that are indefensible, we can either depend upon them less or make them more defensible. Unfortunately, we're doing neither. Now, perhaps you think this foolish dependence is limited to our automobiles. Another researcher, Jay Radcliffe, revealed the second insulin pump. He's a, he's a diabetic himself, and he hacked his insulin pump two years ago. This year at the same DEF CON, he revealed he could hack the second manufacturer. He has now made a decision in the risk reward that he will go back to manual injections because he cannot trust either the manufacturers or the Food and Drug Administration to take these threats seriously. We're hoping to do something about that. But these are medical devices that can give you a lethal dose of insulin. Another researcher who tragically died a week before the hacker conference, Barnaby Jack, one of our best, he was also revealing research of how he could do an assassination via a pacemaker building upon research he had done two years prior. And if you think this is scare tactics, there's been a revelation in the new Dick Cheney book on 60 Minutes that in 2007 he had the wireless functionality disabled from his medical device's pacemaker for just this scenario. Let's take it into our homes. Miss Teen USA was the victim of what they're calling sextortion, but essentially someone with very little hacking skill, if any, downloaded a YouTube video, a former classmate of hers, and enabled her webcam such that he could spy on her in the sanctity of her room. He got nude photos and video and blackmailed her. Now, as a father of two girls, I am very uncomfortable with this. As we bring more of this software and connectivity into our homes, we're inviting the devil into our homes. If it's software, it's hackable. If it's connected, it's exposed. And this is traumatizing for her and others, and it's not very hard to do. There are all sorts of other home things. The recent researchers here in Chicago found that they could take the digitized locks that you can open with your iPhone or your, your phone device or the uh, internet-enabled uh, home alarm systems. And the very things you use to keep bad guys out of your house can be subverted to let them into your house. And as our home appliances are more connected and exposed, we're inviting more and more risk. Now, I'm not a Luddite. I'm not suggesting you smash your devices. But these are things we do not consider when we make our cost-benefit decisions. And then there's researchers like H.D. Moore who scour the internet looking for every embedded operating system and everything's running a bit of software now. And what we're finding is there's all these systems which are vulnerable, exposed, unpatchable, and show signs of exploitation. In fact, there's a, a search engine called Shodan which lets hackers or even non-hackers find industrial control systems, things that control hydroelectric dams, things that control the boiler room of a hotel. Directly connected to the internet, you don't even have to be a hacker, you simply know how to look up the factory default username and password. We are depending on software that is irresponsible and insecure. Now, this is the point where my community will cry FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. They'll say that uh, you're just trying to scare people. But here's the thing, we are so allergic to FUD in our industry. In fact, Nick Selby calls FUD the bastion of the weak. It is often used to sell snake oil to people and separate fools from their money. But here's the thing, just because it's scary doesn't mean it isn't true. So I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to find facts, right? Facts can sometimes be scary, but we can't make risk decisions without knowing the details. And I want you to have a sense of urgency to seek and demand those facts. And that's really the last point, demanding visibility. It may be that that life-saving technology of the insulin pump is worth the risk it may impose. You know, maybe you say, yeah, someone who's gonna steal a credit card isn't going to try to kill me. That's true, but I told you there are so many different types of sharks and post-anonymous, we now realize that anyone with any motivational structure has access to the ability to inflict harm. So if you're afraid of anyone in the physical world, as Dan Gear likes to put it, on the internet, every sociopath is your next door neighbor. So it doesn't matter what most would do, it matters what one would do. So we need to demand visibility. Now what is to be done? I honestly don't know. But I, I worry about the future. I've been doing this for over a dozen years, and we are not getting better. Or we're getting better, but we're getting worse faster. Our dependence on IT is growing faster than our ability to secure it. So I know doing nothing is unacceptable. So a few of us uh, instinctually said, let's write the rugged manifesto. Doctors have a Hippocratic Oath. A few years back, I said developers need their own version of a Hippocratic Oath. 
and it had some ways to inspire and educate and inform people that were creating digital infrastructure. One of the choice lines here is, I recognize my code will be attacked by talented and persistent adversaries who threaten our physical, economic, and national security. Now imagine the people who made the insulin pump if they had simply considered that one sentence. Would the design have included Bluetooth unnecessarily? So we, we tried to do this, and it was directionally correct, but it was insufficient. I'm very proud of this, and several people have applied this. But what we've ultimately come to realize is the greater truth, that for issues of public safety and public good, it needs a public discussion and public solutions. So we can't just solve this in the security and development community. It involves you. Now, Nick Prococo and I, at the same hacker conference when everyone was trying to break things, we sat back, took a step back as concerned fathers who had looked high and low at every agency, the FDA, the National Highway Transportation Safety Board, DHS. We looked everywhere, and we could find no one concerned about this problem. And what we realized is the cavalry isn't coming. No one's coming to save us. And those with knowledge, those in the room, the people sitting to their left, to the right, and in their chair, if they wouldn't step up and be the adults in the room, then no one was going to. Now, this was our clarion call, and we challenged people to come meet us in Louisville, Kentucky, two months later for what we call the Constitutional Ca Congress for Security Researchers. And essentially, we were tackling issues that affected body, mind, and soul, things that affected public safety, public good, and civil liberties. And we had over 100 people spend two days crafting our principles and our beliefs and our identity. What we've realized immediately, though, is our solution is insufficient. While we have domain expertise and we can be a voice of reason and technical literacy, we can't do it alone. The core of every issue we flag is we have very poor perception in the mainstream, we have very little education and awareness to these issues, and we're very bad at doing it. Now, here's the fantastic news. The greater tech community knows a thing or two about education and awareness. So guess what? I'm conscripting you. You're in the cavalry, too. I can't do it alone. We are going to be ambassadors of technical literacy. We need your help. We need teammates, benefactors, resources, capital, and connections. Because while we share in our concerns, we equally share in our outcomes. So the paths forward, I hate to say this, but uh, sharks patrol these waters, and we're already behind. The difference is when you go to the beach and you see sharks, you can choose to stay on dry land. But in this swarming internet of things, we're almost out of dry land. We are adrift in the Internet of Things, and blood is in the water.